a lot for inviting me to the conference, and thanks a lot especially for that introduction. Um, at the Future of Humanity Institute, uh, as you said, we try and look at the big pictures, the big impacts in the world, and I hope to convince you by the end of this talk that one of the very biggest is in AI, and that despite or maybe even because of the great uncertainties out there. Now, you all know the concept of return on investment, so I went initially for a return on investment of what's the biggest impact that I could do in the world? How could I do the most good or the most change? To illustrate, let's start small. This is Kaposi's sarcoma. It's a side effect of HIV. It's tumors, it's rather unpleasant. It can be treated. And if you're treated, it makes your quality of life better, of course. How much better? Well, we have a unit called the Qualy, the Quality Adjusted Life Year, which is basically how many years of life you get more and how good they are. If you treat Kaposki's sarcoma, you get about two-thirds of a Qualy per thousand pounds. Now, this is a good deal for the people who are suffering from this, and definitely I would pay this. But there are more efficient ways of doing things. If you do antiretroviral therapy, your qualies jump. But as probably your mother told you, it's better to prevent than to cure. So if we look at prevention of transmission during pregnancy, we get a much higher scale. In fact, our scale is getting a bit cumbersome. Let's adjust. Because there are other, even better ways of dealing with the spread of HIV. And one of the reasons that it's so important to focus on qualies is that if you tried to prevent HIV by treating Kaposky's sarcoma instead of by through condom distributions, you're basically saying that you are willing to kill 19 twentieths more people than otherwise. Oh, sorry, 19 times more people than otherwise. The cost of inefficiency is in human lives. But this is all about HIV, why are we focused on that? Are there more effective interventions? Indeed there are. Malaria, treated through distribution of bed nets, has currently one of the highest qualies you can get into the 50 qualies for, per thousand pounds spent. These numbers come from the charity assessors giving what we can and give well. They're into effective altruism. If you have any interest in the field, I recommend looking them up. They're really impressive in their work. OK, but what if I say this isn't enough? I want to go higher. Can we get hundreds, thousands, millions of qualies? Yes. This guy is Franz Haber. He has, to his detriment, he invented chemical warfare. To his credit, he invented the Haber-Bosch process, along with a guy called Bosch. This allows the fixing of nitrogen into ammonia. Now, that might not sound very exciting, but this is how you create fertilizers, and this is how you grow crops in the world today. It's estimated that about half of the nitrogen in your bodies is nitrogen that was initially fixed through the Haber-Bosch process and then entered the food chain. So estimates vary. It's really hard to tell in these things, but it's safe to say that there's at least a billion people alive today who would not be alive if this process had not been discovered. What else? The Green Revolution had a similar impact. It's the reason that India and Mexico actually have uh, functioning agricultures at the moment. So again, numbers very speculative, quarter of a billion people saved. And let's just add Franz Jenner, the smallpox vaccine, at least half a billion people saved through that. So this seems a path to high impact. Go for the really great innovations. Even if you have a small chance of getting this in expectation, you should, ha uh, you should make a real big change. Can we get even higher than this? Well, there seems only one way of getting higher. Take a big disaster that would kill lots of people and stop it from happening. So recently, um, I analyzed 12 so-called global catastrophic risks. Uh, from climate change to bad governance and a lot of other disasters in the middle. We established that, so far as we can tell, four of them are truly existential risks. 
that have the potential, at least, to put the very survival of the human race in doubt. There were nuclear war, global pandemics, and certain innovations in biotechnology and artificial intelligence. Now, AI has some unique features amongst all the other risks. It has the most extreme uncertainties, potentially the most extreme risks, potentially also the most extreme benefits, and it has quite a lot of short-term impacts as well. It was at this point that I knew that my search for higher return on investment had ended, and this is where I was going to spend my life working. Let's look at more of this problem. Let's look at the short-term impacts for a start. Now, you're aware, no doubt, that there's a lot of hype concerning AI. You probably receive a lot of it every day. There's also quite a lot of anti-hype. And I won't go into the detail of what's cool, what's not, and what specific thing to look at. There are marketers out there who are doing that much better than me. But there are a few general trends to look at. The first one, as illustrated by this Kurzweil cartoon, is that it's becoming harder and harder to figure out something that humans can do that machines cannot do. As you see there, he's writing down only humans can, and as fast as he writes it down, they fall on the floor. We used to think only humans could drive cars, only humans could play chess, only humans could play Go to a high level. All these things are fallen or falling. Simultaneously with that, there is a very odd pattern that there is no trace of general intelligence amongst these algorithms. So this is Watson, a AI that triumphed on Jeopardy. Jeopardy is an American game show with puns and plays on words and other things of that nature. So it was thought that it was very hard for a machine to win at, and yet Watson did. However, Watson is definitely not a general intelligence. Here, it's hazarding Toronto as a solution to a question whose category was US cities. So Watson doesn't often make a mistake, but when it does make mistakes, it makes stupid mistakes. And this does seem to be the trend. We have a lot of progress in narrow AI, pretty much anything that we can fo uh, focus our attention on, we are achieving, but no trace of a general intelligence. And this is very interesting if you compare what people were believing, say, 20, 30 years ago, where they would say that general intelligence is necessary for solving things like triumphing on jeopardy or driving cars in noisy environments. It turns out it isn't. What other general, overall, meta things can we say about short-term AI? Well, Let's have a look at AI and unemployment. People talk about that quite a bit, and people in my institute did an analysis as to which jobs are more likely to be automated and how fast, and which jobs are least likely to be automated. It seems that there's two broad categories, a big chunk of jobs, almost half, that are very likely to be automated, and a slightly smaller chunk, about a third, that are very unlikely, and very few jobs are actually in the middle. Uh, for illustrative purposes, here are some of the jobs, all the way from insurance underwriters and waiters, whose jobs are very likely to be automated, as far as they can tell, all the way down to physicists and recreational therapists, who are very unlikely to be automated. Now, you have to bear in mind that when we're talking about automating jobs, we're not talking about a one-for-one -one replacement. The old-fashioned secretary was almost completely displaced, not by a cyborg secretary, but by the word processor. Now, a lot of people look at this unemployment as a negative, and it undoubtedly is for the people who lose their job, especially as it's not clear that they'll be able to find new jobs at the same speed as we did in earlier technological revolutions. However, also obviously, if a machine is doing a job uh, for someone and people are using a machine, it means the job is getting done either better or cheaper, which means that as this automation extends, as a whole, the economy is growing. The human race is wealthier and more powerful, and this tells you how that is happening. Now, distribution issues are a complete separate thing. So this is one aspect of what short-term AI will do, doing what we already do better. But there's other things, things like YouTube, Facebook, and immersive games. What these are offering are things that basically no one could offer, or almost no one could offer or do before. Uploading videos, see, uh, seeking the world's knowledge, those kind of things. Social networking, 
Facebook or Facebook-like networks. This is something that just did not exist. And the immersive worlds of games are another added value. So this is something that you could not look at an old economy and predict. There's a few other examples, things like robots extracting people from emergencies, uh, potentials for atomically precise manufacturing, artificial limbs, which are not yet as good as real limbs, but they're getting there. I'm pretty confident that within 20 years, we will have ethical questions such as, is it ethical for someone to cut off their limb to get an artificial one, which would be better? So these are other trends to look at. But this is the short-term AI, which is, to my mind, less exciting. So what is, what's the extreme AI? Or what, since there's a lot of uncertainties here, what's the potential for extreme AIs? Is there any limit on what an AI could do? Well, one way of looking at this is to think an AI is a cognitive machine. What are cognitive tasks? So maybe we can put a limit on that, an upper bound. Well, one cognitive task is, cognitive tasks generally involve things like understanding, prediction, planning, and organizing. Unfortunately, this pretty much means everything. Manufacturing, what's that? You find raw resources, you extract them, you have a manufacturing process where they're assembled and distributed. Most of this is cognitively limited. We pay, we pay factory designers a lot of money. We pay managers money. We don't pay people who operate the machines a lot of money because their skills are not valued. The not valuable for that process. The, what this means is that the limits to manufacturing today are not in the raw resources. The Earth has way more resources of most types than we're currently using, but in the cognitive organizing of the factories of the extraction process. And if there were AIs who were really of extreme capability in manufacturing, they could build robots, they could build factories, etc. So we might have an explosion of manufacturing, and I'm not even getting into the speculative atomically precise and other technological innovations you might have. But what's another cognitive task? Warfare. Warfare, to simplify, is weapon design plus managing your army plus strategy. All these are cognitive tasks. Space exploration is a smaller example of a cognitive task. You have petrol and raw resources under the earth, and then almost purely by cognitive decisions made by highly paid politicians or engineers, this is assembled into a rocket and we have satellites and probes on the most distant planets. The other reason to bring up space exploration is because this means that the resources of the solar system might become available to the AI for the purposes of manufacturing. Finally, let's not forget people skills, which are also cognitive tasks, seduction, moving large amounts of people, getting a large amount of people to buy into your product. All of these are cognitive tasks. So from this perspective, I've completely failed to put any limitations on what an AI could do. Two limitations are the laws of physics and maybe the resources of the solar system. The upper bound is huge. Okay, let's try and build up from below. What kind of thing could we imagine doing with, say, a human-level AI? If we had an AI that had human-level capabilities, what could we imagine doing it? Well, we could imagine copying it a few times and maybe training each of the copies. And then we could create, say, a super committee. Take the AI Edison, the AI Einstein, the AI Soros, AI Clinton, AI Opera, Confucius, Goebbels, Bernie Madoff, and Steve Jobs. All of these are humans who are incredibly cognitively capable in their domains. If you take their AI equivalents, network them together, give them vast amount of data, run them at a thousand times human speed so that they basically have a week to think of every answer that they give you, and you have an entity of potentially vast power uh, most likely able to use the internet and the human race as tools to accomplish its goals. What other ways might we think that AIs might become powerful? 
Well, I've already mentioned the possibility for copying. So here's an idea, the one minute corporation. If you want to create a genuine corporation today, you need a management structure, a complicated thing with a lot of management theory built into it and experience, and you need to hire people, test them, integrate them into teams, and so on. If you had an AI, it would seem it might be much simpler. One, two, three, four, five, six. You have all the employees you need. You might need to train them. Well, you only need to train them once, and you can copy them as much as you want. So maybe spend a week training your, your AIs into thousands of different corporate roles, and then just copy them. You get a perfectly unified corporation that does not require any of the overhead of a normal corporation. So, so currently we have very roughly about two billion computers in the world. When we do get AIs and however many computers we have there, how many do you think we could run? It seems that the amounts that we could run, the amounts of corporations we could create and destroy is vast. And remember that manufacturing is a cognitive task, so if we plug in the AI's capabilities into manufacturing and get more computers, well, how many billions of AI's could we create all potentially integrated in terms of motivation? There's a last brief way that AI's could become extremely powerful. It's sort of self-improvement, self-brain surgery. Now, I don't recommend that you do this yourself. However, an AI is, unlike our messy cludge of a brain, an AI is likely to be much clearer, much easier to see, much easier to analyze. And the AI can also copy itself and experiment on itself again and again and again until it finds the right algorithms. If you see hardware design and hardware manufacture as cognitive tasks, which they mainly are, then this is another way that the AI could boost itself through its own research. So, in summary, there are a few scenarios that suggest that AIs could become extremely powerful, and we have no upper limit, no sensible upper limit to how powerful they could become. So what's the risk? Well, the risk is that the AI does exactly what we tell it to do and not what we want it to do. Ideally, we would want something like flags inside the programming, which ensure that the AI does what we want and doesn't go crazy. Unfortunately, if you try coding these today, you get the error undefined terms. And because these terms are extremely complicated and very hard to ground what we mean by them. Now, if you've done any philosophy, you'll know that chair is also extremely hard to ground, but it is somewhat more important to ground the concepts of not killing all humans than it is to be absolutely sure what is and what isn't a chair. And so there's several ways that this could go wrong. Like, suppose we motivate the AI to prevent human suffering. Now, human is a very difficult concept to code, but imagine that we've managed to code it. Suffering, also extremely subtle, extremely difficult, but again, imagine we've managed to code it. Prevent is an easy concept. But when we've done this, we have just motivated the AI to kill everyone. This is the single best way to prevent human suffering. And it's not so much this example that I want you to take home, but the fact that this kind of motivation is hiding in the initial goal that we gave. Because the initial goal is what we said, it wasn't what we meant. And it seems that kill all humans is a sub-goal of almost very many goals we can give them. For instance, filter out all spam. Well, what's the best way of filtering out all spam? Well, make sure that no email ever gets sent again. So maybe people, maybe we can be a bit clever, and people have suggested things like this. Safe, very complicated concept. Happy, also a very compl complicated concept, but assume we've got them. Now, I think you can see where this is going. <laughs> and 
And the AI will fight you if you try and prevent it from doing this because from its perspective, any other outcome than this is people less safe or less happy. You might shout at it, but that's not what we meant. And the AI will respond. It's having a conversation while it's dragging you off in this uh, picture. Yes, I know what you meant. I'm very intelligent. However, that's what you programmed in me, and nowhere did you program care what we actually meant. Now, there's some people have suggested sort of less uh, immediately deadly ideas. Oh, and by the way, a lot of the features of these ideas is that they're perfectly safe for a weak AI and become very dangerous as the AI becomes very powerful. As long as the AI is weak, these are very safe goals to give it. But anyway, this is another suggestion that people have. Have the AI deduce human preferences from observations? Not intrinsically stupid. There might be ways of doing it. But if we do it naively, I fear that the future of the human race and maybe of the nearby universe will start to look like this. We, it is not clear from looking at us what we truly value and what we would want. Now, that has been somewhat, this is so the risk thesis of extreme AI. You could say uncontrollable and highly dangerous is generic behavior for high intelligent AIs. However, this is a domain with extreme uncertainties. And I would be remiss to not add all the qualifying words on that. You can read more about it in Smarter Than Us, uh, my non-technical introduction to the subject, and my boss's super intelligence. However, even with all the qualifiers added, this is still not necessarily reassuring. And what are the upsides? Well, I've been looking at the disastrous scenario here. The disastrous scenario is an AI of high power that does something bad. And it seems that if you look at the power of AIs and the likely outcome, you get a very strong V-shaped. Weak AIs will bring outcomes that are very similar to our world today, maybe shifted in a slightly better or worse uh, direction. Strong and powerful AIs, it tends to bifurcate into disastrous if we do not get it to do what we really want, and absolutely fantastic if we do. And I mean fantastic pretty much anything you want. Um, you want an end to absolute poverty? Bam, that's a manufacturing problem. Relative poverty is another uh, thing entirely. You want an end to ill health? Well, this is a manufacturing experimentation cognitive uh, problem. This is the kind of things that those extreme abilities I've been talking about, if they were redirected in directions we want, that it could solve. Want to solve death? Well, death is just the extreme end of the ill health problem. Depression, boredom, again, these are cognitive problems that we have some success. Basically, if you think that some hu humans have some success at dealing with these problems, then you should expect the potential extreme AIs to be much more, much better than us at it. So pretty much the lack of anything that we really lack today. So I've been mentioning uncertainty a lot. And why is it? Why is it that predictions about AI are bad? Well, pretty much, first of all, because most predictions are bad. Here are some examples. And I'm putting them up not just so that you can laugh at them, but because the people here were real experts in their domain when they made it. These are not naive idiots. These are people who knew what they were talking about it and still got it spectacularly wrong. So, and now we are in the situation of being in 1929, listening to people like Arving Fisher, who knows more about stocks than pretty much anybody else that we'd likely to meet. And he's saying they're on a high plateau. And why would we believe anything else? And one of the reasons that these predictions are often wrong is that we often underestimate small transformations. And I like to illustrate this often by imagining what if lie detectors worked? What if we actually built a functioning lie detector? Uh, don't worry how we do it, uh, some scanning super whatever. It doesn't matter. But if they did work, well, how would the court system work? It seems it would be a lot fairer to replace it by a simple question and answer session. And the court cases would be over in about 30 seconds, at least for criminal law. 
So if you think of the centuries of legal traditions in different parts of the world that could be overturned by an invention as a uh, lie detector, what about tomorrow's job interview? Could it be the same process? Not, you do not need to get qualifications that show that you have the job, but just state that you have these, that you are willing to do that. And especially if you compare today's job interviews, which are extremely iffy in terms of establishing quality. Um, tomorrow's relationships. So romance, jobs, legal systems, they can be changed completely depending on a technological innovation that may or may not happen. And if you don't keep track of this just one example, you'll get your predictions about the future wrong. Let's get a bit larger scale. Would it be enough? Could you do politics this way? Just run the politicians through a lie detector. What about international relationships? The important thing about lie detector-based international relationship is that you can get trust through politicians who otherwise hate each other and despise each other. So again, one small technological innovation may or may not happen. I have my opinions on whether it will or not. But if it does, pretty much anything you know about the world will be transformed. AI predictions are harder than this. Just to illustrate, this is the Dartmouth conference that's pretty much coined the term AI. They were predicting we would have AI in 1956. Nine years later, Dreyfus, in an otherwise excellent paper, was saying that, no, we've pretty much reached the limit of what automation and computation can do. I think it's safe to say that neither of these predictions have exactly been shown to be accurate. Here's another prediction. AI will be developed in 15 to 25 years' time. You may want to guess when this prediction was made. It was made in 2012. Also, 2011, 2010, and quite a lot of times back to the 1960s. These are the ones I could find. In fact, if you plot AI predictions by when they were made and when they predict the arrival, here's Turing's original prediction, by the way, and this is the AI winter when everyone was pretending that they weren't working in AI anymore. And the thing to notice is there does not seem to be a strong pattern. There does not seem the difference between uh, those bars is 10 years' time. Even if we zoom in, they're spread out pretty much all over the place. There's no strong difference between experts and non-experts, except maybe in this area where there's a little bit of an accumulation. But that's in the 15 to 25-year period. There's a bump in those kinds of predictions. And there's a bump in those kind of predictions even amongst the failed predictions. It seems that there's a psychological reason that people predict in that area. So this is not, so this is strong evidence that people predicting timelines of AIs are not tapping into genuine expertise and are just getting it wrong. Why is that? Well, we actually know what makes good expert predictions and it's not really the quality of the expert. It's the difficulty of the task that they're doing. Pretty much tasks that have the features on the left are tasks at which predictors and experts do well. Tasks which have the features on the right are tasks at which predictors do poorly. Um, and it's, which is why, say, an anesthesiologist is a true expert and most doctors who interpret mammograms are not, even though they probably have equivalent amounts of training in their fields. Uh, these are not equal in importance. Uh, as far as I can tell, the most important are expert disagreement, whether the problem is decomposed or not, and above all else, whether you get feedback, preferably immediate feedback. That's why an anesthesiologist is an expert, because they get feedback immediately. The patient is either not unconscious or dead. In both cases, you know that something's gone wrong. Now, we seem stuck in this for most AI predictions, so we should expect very poor performance, which is what we get. Now, for many narrow AI domains, the short-term things, things move more to the left. Uh, things are more accurate. So look out for features that should give you good predictions. One of the features is that predicting what we call grind is easy, and predicting what we call insight is hard. 
if you want grind, a grind question is how long will it take to make the next Hollywood blockbuster? Well, a Hollywood blockbuster is a huge thing with lots of artistic people doing artistic things, and then there's marketers, and there's money people, and it's all horribly complicated. Except that we know that basically you get all these people together, they work a certain amount, you crank through, and you'll get a movie at the end. We've seen it happen before, it'll happen again. We know how long it should take, we know roughly how long it'll go over when it does go over. We have good distributions because these Hollywood movies happen by a certain amount of work. In contrast, can we predict when someone will solve the Riemann hypothesis? This is a big open question in mathematics. This is much harder to predict, mainly because it requires insight. It requires predicting insight. It's not enough that you get 10 top mathematicians, make them work for five years each, and you'll have a solution. We don't know. And a lot of predictions in AI are actually trying to predict insights, but pretend that they're predicting grind. This is my favorite erroneous AI-type prediction. I call it Moore's Law, hence AI. They go, by the year, blah, 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 computers will have some level of something floating operations per second, amount of data passing through, whatever. And this is a level comparable with the human brain. Then we'll have AI. Now, Moore's law is very much grind. A certain amount of work gets a certain amount of speed increase. We seem to have established that. However, what they're trying to do is look at that bit and not do the hard insight bit of saying, given this hardware, how are we going to get AI? We do not have an AI that we could run now just if we had enough hardware. So we're still trying to predict insight, but this prediction, it looks solid until you realize that they're missing the important bits, the connection between that much, whatever it is, and actual ha actually having AI. So the important thing with all this is not just to look at predictions or despair about them, but act on them. So what are the action modes? Well, for short-term AI, um, this is as far as I can tell what I would think about. First of all, if you're, doing, if you're thinking of looking at what might develop and what might be worth investing or stuff like that, look for grind. If there is something that is following a clear trend, it's likely that this trend will continue. Um, it's likely, not guaranteed. But these are the kind of predictions in AIs that you can probably rely on. You can rely on computers getting faster. You can rely on hard drives getting cheaper. You can rely on a variety of those trends. Other things to look for is, which I haven't really mentioned, but is that there's commercial breakout of known capabilities. There are a lot of things like voice recognitions and then uh, past technologies that were around in academia, in theoretical computer science for a long time until suddenly they got good enough and then they exploded commercially or might explode commercially. So that's something I to keep in mind. Trends in academia that are there, but the commercial application has not yet arrived. Apart from that, where you can get some reasonably good predictions, basically diversification and diversify a lot more than is currently happening because not only are there no real experts in these predictions, nobody's an expert at knowing, even if there were, no one's an expert at knowing a true expert from a non-true expert. So don't follow your guts, don't follow your instincts, don't try and feel where the technology may go. In areas where there's no good predictions, diversify to the max. And finally, New politics and new economics is something to look out for. I hinted at that with the possibility of mass technological unemployment. Possible reemployment, possibly not, we just don't know. There may be transformations in political assumptions and in economic assumptions caused by AI that will change what we think we know. We, it may not be that countries will develop the way that they've always developed in the past. It might become impossible and there might be new exciting ways of doing it, or there might not. So keep an eye out for these changes and maybe act on them if, it's, uh, if it would be of benefit. Now, my area, the extreme AI. So what can be done nowadays 
for extreme AI, for trying to direct, as I say, great uncertainties. There is no guarantee that this technology will happen. There's no guarantees that it'll happen anytime soon. And it might not be as extreme as I've said. Again, on the other hand, it might. So what to focus on? Well, first of all, get the key people thinking. And the key people are the, really the ones who are designing AIs nowadays, the ones who know that the machines they are designing are not dangerous, but who might not think that two generations down, these machines might, not, might be dangerous. The if they start thinking and just think, oh yes, as capacities increase, that would be a great improvement. Because if we get more of these people working on safety or just thinking about safety, we can get, we can really increase the chance of safety, which is, in the end, a good outcome and not sort of a complete existential disaster. Um, organize more research. There's some money is coming into the field at the moment, but there's basically been, considering that this problem might be um, considerably worse than, say, the threat of nuclear war, it is pitifully underfunded at the moment. Um, and the important is to develop general safety tools and ideas. This is what I'm really trying to do uh, myself. Tools that will work not just for one design of AI or one current fashionable idea, but for across a whole family of approaches because we just don't know where the breakthrough might come from if it does. Last of all, um, there's currently no advantage or need for regulation because we don't know what would be regulated. It would require skilled regulators who know more about AI than the people who are designing AI. And the important thing currently is to get the people who are working in AI thinking about the problem. And we're not going to do that by just imposing on onerous and ineffective regulations at the moment. So that's what I would say would be the action plans for the extreme AIs. Anyway, I hope this uh, short introduction to the subject has piqued your interest. Please do feel free to contact me and question me uh, if you want more details. Thank you for listening.